Let us begin our seminars. Uh, my great pleasure to introduce you Professor Novi Padrianza from the University of Sussex, who is also uh, scientific supervisor of our international lab of deep learning based on methods and high school economics. Uh, and this is his first talk, and uh, we will cooperate with him for at least next three years, and hopefully for a longer period. Uh, so it's quite important to find uh, common places of research interest. That is why I kind of ask you, everybody, to listen very carefully, and maybe to generate some ideas uh, that could be uh, the topics for our further cooperation. So uh, today, now we will give us a talk about privileged information. Yes, privileged. Uh, it, uh, much learning with privileged information. So privileged information is information which is available at the time of uh, training, but is not available at the time of testing, well, at least as far as I understand. Yeah. Uh, but probably, uh, now will explain in a better way. So now, please. Thank you, thank you, Dimitri. So yeah, so I'm I'm happy to be here, and uh, maybe I shouldn't call myself academic supervisor, but academic collaborator, hopefully. And I'm not a professor yet. Uh, so. The full title is The Privileged Cube in Machine Learning from Accelerated Learning to Ethical Learning. So as you can guess from the title, it might be some high level uh, talk. So today is 26th of May and I'm from the University of Sussex. So the first introduction is, where is my university, right? So University of Sussex, we are number 140 in the world by the Times Higher Education World. We are not number one. And we don't plan to be number one because we know how our limitation, so we just stay there. And this is the whole campus is here. We are all located in the same uh, location. The whole faculty, computer science, psychology, economics, life science, all in the same uh, area. Do you see that? Yeah. And what is that? Stadium. <laughs> Swim pool. Soccer stadium. No. Swim pool or stadium or something like that. It's a football stadium. <laughs> so we have the football club Brighton and Hove. <laughs> We just entered the Premier League. Wow. Right? So yeah, after 34 years, we are in the Premier League now. <laughs> and then we are in the, if the ranking is not so great, we need to talk about something else, right? So we are in the superb location. So Sussex in the sunniest part of the UK. And we are only minutes from the Brighton Beach. Not very clear, but this is somehow a very nice beach. And we are very close to London as well, 50 minutes uh, by train. And this is will be my talk outline. I'm going to mention about key research result uh, from my group. And then we're going to talk about the privileged cube in machine learning. Although we are from the Bayesian groups, I'm going to talk about as well non-Bayesian. Right? So the non-Bayesian base will be in brief. And then to satisfy your appetite, I'm going to give the Bayesian base in detail. And then the future direction, it will be ethical and legal constraint. That's one future direction. And hopefully the second one is structured prediction with constraint. So what is the first key research result? The first one is a Bayesian structured prediction model. So the problem is how to build a structured prediction models that can handle growing amount of data. So as an illustration of a structured prediction models, it's a name entity recognition tax. How many of you guys have heard about name entity recognition? Almost everybody, right? So here is an example of name entity recognition tax. Since we are from UK, we're talking about Brexit, right? So Theresa May insists Brussels must pay its own Brexit bill. So that's the input, a sentence. Theresa May is our prime minister. And the output of name, name entity recognition, you want to have Theresa as a person, May as a person, and then this is empty, Brussels location, empty, 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 empty. The structured prediction take into account certain information about neighboring words. For example, name of a person usually consists of at least two words. Sometimes you can have three or four words. So the solution for this particular problem is we're using a non-parametric model using Gaussian processes. The reason for that is because the amount of information that non-parametric model can capture grow as the amount of data grows. We still have problem with the scalability. That's where the buffer is going to solve in two months time, right? <laughs> so that's the first key research and stuff. The second one is about how to use additional data that is only available at training time. So 
example of additional data in the training data, for example, <coughs> we have BIPS images and we just have a simple binary classification problems. From the BIPS image, we want to say whether it is a cancerous or not cancerous. What kind of additional data we can have? For example, pathologist report. The pathologist report is an additional information per biopsy image. Mm -hmm. And this particular additional data is not going to be available at deployment time. Why? Because, because, because the patient is alive. Because the patient is alive. Because it's very expensive as well to get the report. Because, because, because we need doctor and time to, to, to do it. Sorry? You need to make a biopsy to make a report. So. But for biopsy, you, you, you already But beyond biopsy, obviously, you always you, have you, the biopsy you, meets. You oh, need okay. to wait time. You need to doctor to exactly. talk to so make all the report. It's all a constraint. It's so expensive. Pathologist. Yes, indeed. So it's, it's very expensive. So that's, that's the point of the pathology report. It's not going to be available at the deployment time. You just wanted to have the deployment time models that take into account just the very cheaply acquired data, biopsy images. So the solution for this particular problem is we consider the additional data as privileged information. The reason is the privileged information will not be used as a direct input to the machine learning models. If you are not using privileged information as a direct input, then you allow the additional information not to appear at the deployment time. So what is the elephant in the room? So why I'm talking about privileged information, right? We know that deep learning methods with convolutional neural networks solve our whole problem, right? <laughs> yeah. right? Do you have a problem with speech recognition? Deep learning. You have a problem with computer vision? Deep learning. You have a problem with NLP? Deep learning. You have a problem with your life? Deep learning, <laughs> right? So this is an example of a structured prediction problems, object recognition or object detection, sorry, with the region CNN. Can you see that? That's the input mm -hmm. of this particular CNN and the output that you want to have, for example, object detection of an elephant and not an elephant. Maybe the picture is not clear. That was me teaching with the elephant. So what we are interested in is the elephant and not the elephant. <laughs> so, what's, so what's happening? The current trend is deep learning and I'm doing privileged learning. But the thing is, the deep learning research hits the same knowledge barrier as our research. So what is the question in deep learning nowadays? How to compress big ensemble large model into a small production model? You want your model to run in the mobile phone. You want to have your model run in the Windows machine. Right? So the solution for this particular deep learning question is, to distill knowledge from big ensemble model to the small models. So that's the solution from the deep learning research. So the one that our question is very similar. How to put a large convolutional neural network models into a mobile phone? And our answer is considering the deep convolutional neural network features as the privileged information and you use the compact <coughs> or very cheap features as the input to your models. So the privileged information and knowledge distillation or dark knowledge are two sides of the same coin. How many of you guys have heard about distillation, dark knowledge? Right? <laughs> so the dark knowledge, before it's a dark knowledge, especially before it is called Bayesian dark knowledge, it's just all about compression compressing predictive distribution, right? That's the same in the ICML 2005. Uh, I have a question. Why is privilege? I mean, you can create these features for test data too. Why the privilege? <coughs> What's the question? Uh, isn't to try the privilege uh, information is like something that you can create only for training data. That's correct. But you can create these features <coughs> for test data too. But you don't want if it is too expensive. Oh, okay. Right? Is it expensive to compute or expensive okay. to store? So no matter where you are, whether you are empirical risk, Bayesian, or deep, you have to consider learning using privileged information. Right? So during training, you get 
an additional information we denote it as x star about training examples x that is not going to be available at deployment time. Why it is not available at deployment time? Several reasons for that. If it is too expensive to compute, too expensive to store, or for example, if you would like to get the expert domain knowledge that is not so easy to acquire during the deployment time. So that's called cost efficient constraint. So far so good? Mm -hmm. So this is the setting, just to summarize. What we are given is a set of n input output examples. In our supervised tasks, we always have the input x and the output the y. We are talking about binary classification, y plus 1 minus 1. And we have an additional set, which is x1 to xn star. Your privileged information need to be unique per instance. You have x1 star for the x1. And what we want is a classifier that benefit from the x star, but that particular classifiers or the function cannot use the x star as a direct input. Why do you want to do looping? What is looping? Learning using privileged information. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, I should keep mentioning about that. So why do you want to use Privileged information? The answer is because it can accelerate your training or your learning process. Only? What, what uh, you can't it uh, make our learning process uh, more efficient, more accurate? More accurate, it's maybe coming from the accelerated learning, especially when you have few number of uh, samples. Then since you have an accelerated learning, then maybe you get uh, a better accuracy. But uh -huh. it's not a direct guarantee. Okay. So what do I mean by the accelerated learning? So first of all, I need to mention about what do I mean by learning scheme, right? So this is the learning scheme in the non-Bayesian setup. We assume that we have n training data, sampled from an unknown but fixed distribution, joint distribution between x, y. And we are given a collection of function, f, parameterized by the w, w the set of the lambda, the goal of the learning is to choose one of those W that minimize the risk with respect to a particular loss function, delta. Right? So the risk is expectation with respect to the joint input-output distribution of your loss function. And how to bound this particular risk? The bound of this particular risk will depend on two components. The first one is empirical risk. Empirical risk, and the second one is something related to VC damage. Indeed. So a quantity that is correspond to the capacity of your function class. And this particular quantity B will depend on the complexity of your function class and also we depend on the number of training data point n. And this particular quantity, it will go to zero as long as the n goes to infinity. So it means that the accelerated learning, it refers to how fast this particular quantity goes to zero with respect to the number of data point n. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it a standard formulation for accelerated learning? If you cast it as in terms of learning uh, with respect to the bounding the, uh, risk. So for example, if you have a particular term, B, which is 1 over N, and the other term or the other possibility, you have 1 over square root of N. Which one is faster with respect to the number of N? The first one. Hmm? The first one. Which one is the first one? 1 uh, over N. Yes. Right? So the point here is about using previous information. You wanted to improve this particular bound from, for example, 1 over n, sorry, 1 over square root of n to 1 over n. Because you will require much less number of training data if you get the 1 over n dependency here. 
How many of you guys still following? No, I think everybody. Everybody, excellent. <laughs> So what's the point about this particular talk is we wanted to generalize this particular privilege learning. I would like to turn a real world constraint into the privilege information. So we want to build machine learning models with real world constraint as privilege information. So for example, when you have cost efficient constraint, when you want to have deployable models in the mobile device, where the mobile device has some strong energy constraint, you want to use the large model as privilege information and the compact models to be the one at the deployment time, to be at your mobile phone. That's using privilege information to address cost efficient constraint. Another type of constraint, which is what currently exciting, is ethical and legal constraint. So for example, here, there is a legal right to an explanation of a decision made by an algorithm. In the UK, there is a requirement for that. In the EU, there is a requirement for that. Possibly here as well, that any automated decision need to be able to explain the decision to the human being. Right? So in that, you can use complex, uninterpretable features as privileged information. And at deployment time, you only use simple, interpretable features. And from there, what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to define a framework or a cube that try to take this into account. So this is the privilege cube in machine learning. So as I mentioned, the talk is very much high level because this is just to try to describe what our group is currently doing. So how the privilege cube looks like? First of all, it looks like a cube. Good that it looks like a cube. Whew, right? So we we start from the this particular point. If you see, if you go to the y-axis, you get from the non-structured problem, for example, classification, regression. You go to that particular y-axis, and here you get the structured problems, name entity recognition that I mentioned in the beginning, object detection. If you go to the x-axis, you go from the non-Bayesian and you go to the Bayesian models. What I would like to capture here is we want to have a framework that fill up all those vertices in the cube. Right? So you have the problems, you have the models, and on the z-axis is in terms of the constraint. So in here you start from cost efficient constraint, and you can go to the z-axis in the ethical and legal constraint. And if you start from this particular black node, that will be non-Bayesian models for non-structured problem with a cost-efficient constraint. And those are the available model for that. SPM plus, margin transfer, knowledge distillation, model compression, it's all lies on this particular vertex. Just to remind you, the goal is to have a machine learning models that benefits from privileged data, but the model cannot directly use the privileged data as the input. You mean at the testing stage? Yes. <coughs> you cannot use the privileged data at the testing. You cannot use it as an input to your function because it will not be available at the test time. Mm -hmm. Any one of you guys have heard about SVM Plus? Any one of you guys have heard about SVM? Yeah. Yes. So how do you write down SVM formulation? Sorry, as, as I mentioned here, I'm not going to mention about the non-Bayesian in detail, but just to warm up, how can we do a privilege information in the non-Bayesian setting where we want the privilege information is not to be the input to your function? So how would you write down SVM formulation, soft margin SVM? I'm waiting. So we have to minimize minimize with L2 regularization. Okay. Subject to 
subject to right classification? Right classification? Y i w x i greater than one minus epsilon psi 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 for all i one to n. And if I plus i plus the times sum of psi. And probably one more constraint that psi should be negative. Yeah. Excellent. So everyone still remember that? Yeah. Right? Oh, and this particular optimization is with respect to the W and the psi, psi i as well, right? Mm -hmm. So how can you make use? So by the way, what is the function? What is our prediction function? If you have a test point, what will be this function? <coughs> so with this particular formulation, if I don't tell you about SPM plus, where will you put the privilege information? Mm. I'm just trying to wonder whether maybe you can solve this particular problem mm -hmm. where it was published in 2009, but you haven't read that paper before. Maybe you can give me the solution. Shouldn't it, shouldn't it depend on the particular type of privileged information? This is, can be rare, no? That's true, but uh, maybe just give me one particular example. So here, here we're assuming problem. that the privileged information is just additional vector to xi, xi star, right? Yes, so you have the xi, and then you have the privileged information xi star. <coughs> uh -huh. You note that the w just used this particular information from xi not from the xi star, right? So you shouldn't be expanding the w to be using the xi star and xi. You just wanted to use just okay. the xi. If you can change constraints on c, oh, c. Psi? How would you change that? Third. To depend on the privileged information, right? Yes. So this particular psi i, is a value that is unique for each of the training data point. Since you have an extra information per training data point, the easiest way to do is to make this psi i to be w star xi star. Hmm. Right? Is everyone happy with this? I, I, I'm no? Not sure. Dimitri says no. <laughs> <laughs> so how to satisfy Dimitri? <laughs> but shouldn't we establish at least additional psych variable? Because we can't still guarantee that we'll satisfy those constraints, even with privileged information. Yes, yes. You should be adding that particular uh, slack variable. You can do that. Will you be happy with that? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> So what is, what, is, what, is, what is the intuition? Yes, what is the intuition here? That's exactly the thing I can't understand. Yeah. <laughs> what would be our benefits? It's, it's very, very hard indeed. I'm still not understanding as well. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the one recipe that you mentioned, right? So what is the benefit here? <laughs> so the argument here, when you try to do without the addition of slack, in the standard soft margin SVM, you need to figure out the weight factor, which is, for example, in the d-dimensional space, and these n variables, right? Mm -hmm. You need to figure out the w and the n. If you have many, 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 many training data point, how many variables that you have to optimize? Many, 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 because that is the n here, right? Yes. So if I replace this particular psi i with the w star x i star, and the w star lies in the d star. D star. D star, right? And then instead of optimizing with respect to the slack, now you're optimizing with respect to the w and the w star. In this formulation, no. <laughs> Does this formulation work? Sorry? Does this formulation work? 
we do not have enough degrees of freedom to satisfy all the constraints in the worst case. Yeah? Because it may happen that the constraint is still uh, doesn't hold and we need some SOC variable. Yes. And the number of SOC variables grows with the number of data. Yes. Many, 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 many. many. Yes. <laughs> But the main advantage is when you are trying to make the acceleration learning from the 1 over square root of n to 1 over n is this particular formulation. When you try to instantiate the select variable with just the parametric form with respect to the w star. Oh, but do you agree that uh, still there are, there are no guarantees? That without select variables, we will manage to satisfy all the constraints. Yes, the Bayan argument here is supposedly you have the oracle that tell you exactly the value of the slack. With that particular oracle setup, you are turning soft margin SVM into hard margin SVM. Right? If someone tells you exactly what is the value of the oracle, you don't need the slack anymore. Right. Right? Right. And now you parameterize your oracle with a linear function. Yes. But the oracle may be nonlinear. The oracle may be nonlinear, yes. <laughs> Do you understand, right, that uh, by doing this, we definitely reduce the number of non zero selects. And uh, we'll obtain acceleration by this. Yes. So we'll still need select variables, but there'll be fewer number of non zero. Variables. So the, the, the hope is uh, you will be, yes, you will be having much less uh, non-zero slack variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you add another slack variables after this particular parameterization. And in the ideal case, we will not need either slack variables. In the ideal case, we don't need the additional slack mm -hmm. variables. So you just need to infer the W and the W star. Mm -hmm. That's what Vavnik comes out in the SVM plus in 2009. But do we use constraint with psi i that is greater than zero? Yes, yes, yes. So you, you have that. Mm -hmm. You have that. So you're just replacing the psi i with the linear parameterization. So we managed to use the number of parameters in our optimization problem, and by doing this, we may obtain acceleration. Yes. And we don't use regularization for W star. Oh, do we? We have, we have. Indeed. I'm, I'm start filling up one by one now. Exactly. You have to. You have to. With some conditions. With some conditions, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're still awake. Excellent. With some coefficient. We have the regularization on the W, W star, and with some coefficient as well. So that's the SPM plus. And that's not the main point of the talk. Right? That's just giving you an this example a of brief the, part. That's the brief part. Yes. <laughs> so this is the at this particular Vertex, SPM plus, how to use the previous information in a non Bayesian setting. Another, another example of this particular point is knowledge distillation or model compression. How would you use that? In here is much simpler. It's tailored towards the neural network. What people do is you first train a large complex models. And then you use the output of that particular complex models to be the labels instead of using the original labels. Or you can still mix as well the original labels with the output from the complex models. So that's knowledge distillation, model compression. An example of the cost efficient constraint in computer vision here, I'm just going to describe about this particular specific setup of the previous information. You are given an image X, and you wanted to predict whether this particular image it says about the soccer or not soccer. And what is the example of privileged information? If you have the additional information in terms of the bounding box where the object is. But doesn't it mean that uh, the presence of bounding box itself means that this picture belongs to class soccer? 
Yes, so it is much more informative if you extract the feature around this particular bounding box, right? Because when you are just given the whole image, you wanted to predict soccer, your feature extraction will take into account all those non-informative, non-soccer ball information, right? Mm -hmm. And this particular X star is very informative because you get the bounding box around the object that you are interested in and you can extract features on that particular soccer ball. Another example of cost-efficient constraint is what we did was we tried to use the feature selection and use the unselected features as the privileged information. And that is because if you use the unselected features, if you are do doing feature selection, you are reducing the variance of the models because you are using much less number of features. But you might increase the bias. The way you use the unselected feature or discarded feature as previous information is to get this particular variance reduction because of the feature selection, but try to limit the increase in the bias. And now we are going to talk to me in the one that in detail, the Bayesian methods. So what is available for the preference information in the Bayesian methods is just GPC plus and the GPC con. <coughs> just to remind the setup that we are given an input output examples. We have an additional information per data point and we want to make use of this particular additional input during the training time. And why do you want to do a Bayesian modeling? <laughs> why not? Oh, oh, uh, all methods Give works. me a reason why do you want to do Bayesian modeling? All, all methods work because they are Bayesian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any Special other, any other, other, no, any other <laughs> reason, <laughs> reasonable answer? No. 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 <laughs> want to estimate uncertainty. Yes. We want to estimate uncertainty, okay? Very good. Don't and one other thing? To achieve good pattern distribution to build ensembles, for example. That's the uncertainty? Yeah. This uncertainty, yes. What are the things? Why do you want to do Bayesian modeling? I'm missing data. You have missing data, okay? And the other thing is the optimization based hyperparameter, right? So sometimes you need to motivate why do you need to use Bayesian models. So in this particular talk, the additional data, I'm just going to make it to be as simple as possible. The additional data will be a confidence in the label annotation. Imagine in the setup when you get the label information from the crowdsourcing. In the crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing setup, mm -hmm. you are not going to ask just one annotator. You try to ask two or three annotators. So this particular X star is the confidence with respect to the annotator that you ask. Since it is con considering confidence, I'm going to rename the star to the conf. This is just the agreement score among the annotator in the crowdsourcing scenario for input xn and the label yn. An example is if we are talking about classification tags and deciding whether a place is fun or not fun from an image. You are given this particular image, London Zoo, and you ask three annotators, Homer, Lisa, and Milhouse. Out of those three, two say that it's a fun place to be. One annotator say that it's not a fun place to be because there was an escape orangutan. You are not seeing the picture there. So in here, your additional information is a confidence that this particular image is a fun place to be. And that particular confidence is 2 over 3. Because 2 annotators agree out of 3 that this image is shows a fun place to be. Right? So that's the examples of the confidence that I'm talking about. And which level do we accept in this case 1? It's a fun place to be, yes, according to the majority. And how are we going to solve this particular privilege information in the Bayesian setting? 
using Gaussian process, right? So how many of you guys know about Gaussian process? Everyone, right? So you know about SVM, you know about Gaussian process, you have the freedom to choose, right? Mm -hmm. right. So the Gaussian process defines a distribution over function. Right? The statement is it generalized multivariate Gaussian and is fully specified by the mean function and the kernel or covariance function. How does the Gaussian process look like? This is supposed to be an animation. So this is an example of a sample from the Gaussian process. If I'm saying that Gaussian process is a distribution over function, when I sample from the Gaussian process, what I get is a function, right? So this particular visualization is using a covariance or kernel function of squared exponential, right? And here is the input axis, and there is the y axis, and every time, one particular animation is just three samples from the Gaussian process prior. This is the Gaussian process priors, and what you're going to do is, if you observe a particular x and the y value, what does it do to your Gaussian process? You get a sample from the Gaussian process posterior, right? Where this particular input it's already clamped the value at a particular output one. And this is again, every step of the animation is just a three sample from the Gaussian process posterior now. Because you have observed the one, two, three, four, five. And what is the nice thing about this particular Gaussian process posterior? And got the uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. If you see here, all those that the point, the observed at the point, if you are close to the observed at the point, the uncertainty here, the shaded area is very small. If you are away from the observed at the point, your uncertainty is very high. Right? So this is the nice thing about the Gaussian process because it had code uncertainty. I'm going to skip the advertisement because all of you guys know about Gaussian process, right? So in here, how can we use Gaussian process for doing classification? What is the main ingredient of Bayesian models? You have the prior. What is the next thing that you need to specify? Well, likelihood. You, you step in one. <laughs> likelihood, right? So what is the likelihood for the classification problems? Here is the likelihood for classification problems. The likelihood of uh, output y and given the input xn, and the function f is given by the heavy side step function that take the input as the product of the label and the function output. If the y, which is the output, matches the prediction, this quantity will be positive. And take the heavy side will be the one. And if it is wrongly classified, you will get the negative value. And take the heavy side, you get the zero. Right? And with the Gaussian process, the function f, you will take it from the Gaussian <coughs> process with a specific mean function and the kernel function. The mean function here is zero, the kernel function is whatever you choose, square exponential covariance function, for example. Do we really need the heavy side function or can we use just, sig just a sigmoid function? Yes. You know that there is an equivalency between that. So in here, if I take the heavy side step function, I'm considering that f is actually a noisy latent function. So specifically, it's f, which is taken from the Gaussian process, plus some noise, which is a Gaussian distributed as well. If you integrate out the noise, you get the standard probit function, where this particular link between the label times the output with respect to your likelihood will be a Gaussian CDR. That's the standard probit model that you have. But it's equivalent between using heavy side step function and using a probit CDF link function. So how are we going to do with the level confidence? How are we going to take into account this extra information? So the easiest is you just take another letter function G that only depends on the extra information. 
X and confidence. That's another Gaussian process. So instead of one Gaussian process, you have two Gaussian process now. And you need to redefine your likelihood. Because this particular likelihood does not take into account the additional information of X and con. And this is the way we redefine the likelihood <coughs> function. Mm -hmm. So in here, what we have is we are going to use the output of another letter function G as the indicator, as the choice between the standard step likelihood function. So you are expecting the G for an ambiguous data point, the G is going to be expected to be negative. When the G is negative, when you put the heavy side step function of negative is equal to 0, 1 minus 0 is equal to 1, and you get the standard step likelihood function when your instance is unambiguous. When three out of three annotators agree about the labels, you get the standard step likelihood. When you have ambiguous data instance, two out of three annotators agree with the labels, you get the likelihood contribution of reduce from the standard step likelihood. With the unambiguous data instance, you get the standard likelihood. With the ambiguous data instance, the influence of that particular data instance is going to be reduced. Can you see that? Why it is going to be reduced? The easiest way to see is you need to integrate out the G from this particular likelihood function. That's how it looks like. So I'm going from the, this particular likelihood to try to explain to you by integrating out the G function. Mm -hmm. Remember the G is expected to be negative for an ambiguous <coughs> data instance, and the G is expected to be the positive when you have ambiguous data instance. If you integrate out the G, you get this particular likelihood. You have the probability of G mm -hmm. being positive multiplied by one half plus one minus the probability of G being positive multiplied by the standard step likelihood. How many types of possible value this probability of G greater than zero can take? Probability of G greater than zero can take either zero, either one, or in between 0 and 1. Right? Everybody happy with that? So when the probability of G greater than 0 is equal to 1, exactly 1, what will you get? 1 minus 1 is equal to 0. zero. Multiply by the step likelihood is equal to 0. And your contribution of the likelihood of that particular data point is only going to be 1 half. And since you have a binary classification problems, the likelihood will be just a random coin flip. That's when the probability of G greater than zero equal to one. When the probability of G equal greater than zero equal to zero, what will you get? Standard likelihood. The standard likelihood. When you get the probability of G greater than zero in between zero and one, what will you have? A reduced influence for that particular data points because now your likelihood will be a mixture of one half and the standard step likelihood. Right? You get just a mixture of those two quantities. Are you guys still following? In case you are not following, this is the summary. All you need in life is ignorance and confidence. And then success is sure, right? But you need to know when to ignore and when to be confident, right? So the way you need to decide whether this particular un or ambiguous that the point will be ignored or will be reduced the influence or will be taken as informative as the unambiguous that instance, you need to figure that out from the data. You need to infer the G latent function, right? So that is the model.
And what we are going to do for the postural inference, instead of the variational inference with the reparameterization trick, we are going to do the expectation propagation. What is expectation propagation? Some approximate Bayesian inference algorithm. <laughs> How many of you guys have heard about that? So what is the difference? The reverse, right? Locally. So instead of KLPQ, it's KLQP, right? No, it's reverse. <laughs> KLQP is a variational inference when the Q is your approximating distribution. Expectation propagation is KLPQ when the Q is your approximating distribution and your P is your posterior. Mm -hmm. So you all follow that and that's what we do, the expectation propagation. You need to try to infer the f posterior. The f is a function that works on your original input space x. You need also to infer the g posterior, which is a function that acts on your confidence, the extra information. You need to infer the posterior for those f and the g. I'm not going to go into how do you do expectation propagation because all of you guys have very familiar with that, right? I've heard about that, so <laughs> I would say. <laughs> why there's no question about why we don't use the variational inference with reparameterization trick? No, no that, that's quite interesting. Why? <laughs> why don't you? <laughs> it's a very good point. <laughs> so why we don't use that? Well, we have two options. We just choose one of them. Maybe next time we can use the variational <laughs> inference. <laughs> But if you use the alpha divergence, you know that when you vary the alpha from 0 to 1, you get the full sweep of the variational inference and expectation propagation, right? Right. So maybe instead of just using one or the other, you can just use the general one if you want to extend the model. And that's all about the models. Any question? Well, why these two models, as we have plus and GP, mm -hmm. point, seems absolutely different. In SVM plus, we compare the outputs of two linear functions for simple features and for additional features. Why not to do the same thing with GP, to compare F and G in some, well, soft max or something? Why are you doing a completely different life? Yeah, it's a very, very good point. It was coming from our previous work. So the first thing that we do for this particular likelihood, we didn't use this particular likelihood. This is, we choose this because we need to do the efficient inference in the closed form expectation propagation. What will be the equivalent of the slack in the Gaussian process? You have a slack in the SVM, you have a, in the Gaussian process? Hmm? The variance. The variance, the noise, right? Instead of taking the zero and sigma squared noise, we can make it depend on. Indeed, yes. So what is the standard way? You have the y, you have the function x plus some noise. And the noise here usually from the zero sigma squared, right? The easiest way or the most equivalent way to perform privilege information in the GP is to make the sigma to depend on your mm -hmm. x star. So this particular sigma, sigma squared, you will have for each of the data point. And that corresponds to the heterosedastic right. Gaussian process classification. So we have that in the NIPS 2014, but the inference will not be so efficient because of the difficult likelihood function, it doesn't involve this particular choice of heavy side step function. Our inference, this particular quantity, the normalization constants, will not be computable in a closed form format. We need to do a one-dimensional quadrature. Mm -hmm. and that, but that was the first step that we <coughs> tried to make equivalent between the slack and the noise. And then we tried to progress from the difficult inference to just try to remodel the likelihood, which hopefully still makes sense. Are you happy with the answer? 
Well, <laughs> or not so much. <laughs> not so much because it seems that it is always possible to do a good inference even in this model. But... Okay. So you can have a better inference procedure than what we have in 2014. So <laughs> we'll be looking forward to that now. And what about uh, expectation propagation? Are all equations tractable here for iterative computation? Yes. 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 It's all because <laughs> all of them are just making use the your approximating distribution is a Gaussian. Sure, sure. You know, yeah. But anyway, you should, 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 in, uh, should take some integrals. And all of them can be computed analytically, yes. right? Yes. Because of probit like. Ah. Hmm? Because of the probit like use, and especially, yeah. Because when you do the, this particular yes, MSI yes, step yes. function, when you integrate out, you get the probit. So everything goes to the probit. Mm -hmm. How are we doing with the time? Well, it's all right. <laughs> you might have 15 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever you, yeah. you want. Do you want to hear about the experiment? Of course. Yes. Yes. Of course, okay. So in here, the experiment, we are going to look into the attribute classification. So you are given an image. You want to classify it. Whether this particular image, it says a particular attribute. Warm or not warm. Sunny or not sunny. Open or not open. Green or not green. There are 83 uh, attributes correspond to the 83 binary classification tasks. And the data set half the label come from the three annotator, from the mechanical term. So in here, your label confidence and code the agreement among the three annotators. So your x star is one dimensional, right? Y yes, the x star is one dimensional, either two thirds or one. If it is two out of three agrees or three out of three agrees. Would it make sense to add labels into X star? It makes sense if you are <coughs> augmenting that. But you already have the label anyway, right? You have this particular label Y. And but if you want to extend the X to become the X confidence concatenated with the Y, you can do that. But there is a requirement here that your privilege information, you want to be as unique as possible to each of the data instance. Why? Because you would like to have that to encode the slack variables in here, in this particular SVM formulation, and the noise in the GP formulation. So you want, in principle, to be as unique as possible. So you can use the uh, label information as the privilege information, but that will correspond to be the same as you are using the label data itself, right? So you only have the positive sample and the negative sample. And what you want from the previous information is you need to grade those positive samples. So you need to make sure or you need to know which particular examples in that positive is easy or hard to classify. In that particular context, the slack variables tells you about that. Uh -huh. Because those that are hard example will have large value of slack. Those that are easy have a small value of slacks. So if you get, if you can use the previous information to tell you about more so information among your positive and negative classes, you get the better training procedure for that. So we may concentrate on the hard to classify objects while uh, paying less attention to easy to classify objects. Yes. But also we may the training sample. Yep. And actually this could be the key. So the, uh, such procedure may at least potentially improve the accuracy. So there is uh, you concentrate on the most yeah. difficult parts, just like we do in boosting, for example. Yeah, there is there is a paper uh, in 2014 uh, to show that the previous information sometimes you can also view it as a weighted SVM because the weight is coming from the previous information itself to tell you which particular instance to concentrate yes. and which particular instance not to concentrate. So the result here is, for that particular 83 classification task, we compare the GPC-conf with the 
Bayesian models that does not take into account the preference information, which is GPC. We also compare with the SVM. We also compare with the SVM plus. I do not see which one is which because the projection is not very much clear. But those that are more blue on the top, it means that the GPC conf is outperforming for that particular classification tax or for that particular attributes. So the more blue, the more happier you are. <laughs> and that corresponds to the, with respect to other Bayesian models or the non-Bayesian SVM and SVM plus. And that is the summary. This is the ranking. So if you're talking about accuracy, the higher rank, the better. This is the summary across the 83 data set. We're comparing SVM plus, SVM, GPC, GPC Corp, and this is the DR model GPC plus where we take into account the privilege in the noise. If you connect those methods together, methods that are connected by the line means that they are not statistically significant. So there are performance different between the Bayesian to the non-Bayesian models. So we're all happy, right? Because we're all doing the Bayesian models. And this is particular rank show that the Bayesian model indeed outperformed the non-Bayesian models, SPM plus. And, and the Gaussian process classification. And the Gaussian process classification that, that doesn't take into account the uh, privilege sure information. Yeah. And why SPM plus is working worse than just SPM? That's a very good point. That corresponds to a Dimitri equation when we start adding the hyperparameter. You start having the C, you start having the lambda, and then when you're talking about the non-linear features, you have the kernel width correspond to the X, and kernel width correspond to the X star, you have four hyperparameters. How would you infer the four hyperparameters? You need to do a cross-validation, but then you have a problem with the number of trend data that you need to use. And covariance function was selected automatically. Yes, in, in Gaussian process. In Gaussian process, we, we did use squared exponential, only the kernel width you need to yes. uh, optimize with but the, the marginal likelihood. The kernel width. The marginal likelihood. Marginal yes. mm -hmm. right? So that's why the... Uh, this is the benefit of Bayesian precision. Yes, that's what we observe with this particular setup. Not all the time we observe that. That's why we need some convincing argument from you guys. But for this particular setup, we did observe that because of the hyperparameter optimization. And this is the running time, and that running time is actually encode that particular cross-validation requirement as well. The SPM plus, it has high running time just because we need to do a cross-validation on those four hyperparameters. But in general, usually non-Bayesian, it will be faster than the Bayesian. Any other comments? And this is related to the analysis of the confidence in the level annotation. So this is when I was mentioning in the beginning, you decide whether you are going to ignore or you are going to reduce the influence of the ambiguous data point or you are going to take the ambiguous data point to be as informative as the unambiguous data point. It comes from the G value. Mm -hmm. So in here, the red curve here is probability of G being positive. And in here, when you have the confidence 1, and you have the confidence 0 0.66. So when the confidence 0 0.66, which is 2 out of 3 agrees with the label, the probability of G being positive is equal to exactly 1. So in that particular case, you are going to use the likelihood which is one half. So you ignore the ambiguous data instance, given this particular curve. Because the probability of G being positive is equal to one. Probability of G being positive for the confidence is always zero. So you always take into account the unambiguous data instance as usual. In this particular curve, you get the same probability of G being positive is equal to zero for the confidence data instance. For the two out of three agrees, you get the probability of G being positive equal to the 0 0.5 in here. That's correspond to the reduced influence, a mixture between the 
step likelihood and the one half likelihood. Uh, Dimitri, you have a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, I still don't understand the difference between uh, three pictures. Yeah, so in here, what you need to concentrate is the red curve. So red curve is what? Probability of G being positive. And uh, if, if G is positive, then we take the point, the training point. Yes? Or, or, or? No, depending on the value of the... Yes, depending on the value of the probability of G being positive. If the probability of G being positive is equal to zero, mm -hmm. means that you are going to use the step likelihood. I don't remember the notation. Yeah. Ah. So if it's zero, we take the point. If it's yeah. one, we ignore the point. Ignore the one half, and then if it is between zero and one, you take the some, mixture. Some compromise. Yes. yes. Okay. And this is just showing that you need to infer this G being positive equal to zero, one, or in between zero and one from the data set itself. So you don't set beforehand. Mm -hmm. And this is the visualization of three different data sets ah, that, give you a, that give you a different value of the probability of G being positive. So in the, in the first instance, what you need to concentrate is just the red curve and the point where you have the confidence one, which is three out of three, and the confidence 0 0.66, which is two out of three agrees. And that's where the difference of the G being positive, either it is equal to one, or equal to in between zero and one, or it's equal to zero. So in this particular visualization, you take the ambiguous data instance to be as informative as unambiguous data instance. So we simply uh, treat all data points uh, mm -hmm. equally similar. Yeah, right. in this particular uh, data set, with this particular inference of the G. Mm -hmm. So in here, you reduce the influence of the ambiguous data instance. Yes. And in this visualization, you completely ignore. So you need to decide from the data whether in this particular collection of data set you should ignore the ambiguous data point, include the ambiguous data point as informative as the unambiguous data point, basically increase the amount of your training instance, or you take the reduced influence of the ambiguous data instances. And we're deciding uh, on that automatically? Yes, we're deciding that automatically when we infer the posterior of the G. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to talk about future direction because we're already a bit late. Is there any other question? Let me try to use something other than uh, the confidence as a start. Yes, we did try uh, quite a lot. Uh, in the beginning, I was mentioning about the bounding box as the uh, previous information. You can also use the uh, attributes, attribute representation, whether a particular object, instead of just a class, you also have an attribute, for example, furry, uh, it's green, black and white, stripes, long tail. You can use that as a privilege information as well. You can use also textual text text information when you have emails and then you have the text. You can also use that as a preference information in text. And in one, when we propose the GPC plus, we actually consider uh, convolution on neural network features as the preference information. Yeah, which it right. Yes, it it uh, it improves the performance when we use the uh, surf features, speed up robust features, surf or C features as the original representation and we take into account the deep CNN feature as the privilege, which is what not going to be available at the program. Which can maybe faster, like, right? Yes. Yes. So the six features are easy to calculate? Hypothetically, but you are right. <laughs> what about maybe you can use a color histogram and hopefully because it doesn't work for us when we use the color histogram, it's just too not informative for the categorization. But ideally, yes, we, we, we need to use as cheap as just color histogram. That would be ideal. Uh, how scalable is this technique? Uh, the, scalability, the scalability is, is the same, uh, the standard scalability, which is if you're using a pseudo input, it will be number of uh, data instance multiplied by the, uh, the number of pseudo input, n m, n m squared or the m cubic. I wonder, can this be combined with your scalable GP techniques? Where is on GT? Uh, GPConf. No, uh, Dimitri is working on the uh, structured prediction. The, 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 the first challenge? 
Yes, so that's our many. Th he's working over many things. One of them includes <laughs> scalable GP. Yes, and I have requested him personally to help us with the scalable GP for the structured prediction. Ah, okay, yes. okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so he's already occupied. <laughs> yes, for two months. Well, well, yes. Okay. Is there any question or we are free to go? Okay, probably all questions have been asked during your presentation. Thank uh, you. No, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I should say that uh, uh, these are quite interesting formulations. Um, traditionally, we, well, when we uh, tell about Bayesian uh, framework, uh, we usually mean the situation when, uh, for example, we have weak labeling. So when uh, in the training data sets, uh, we don't know the exact values of, of the labels, uh, so-called weakly annotated data. Here's the situation is a bit similar, uh, but privilege information is a bit different formulation, and it's uh, cool that it, it can still be reformulated on the Bayesian language. And uh, what I like the most is the fact that uh, actually in Yandex and in other companies, we do have uh, pretty similar formulations. In the case when uh, the data is taken not from mechanical term, but from some assessors. Actually, this is uh, pretty much the same as mechanical, mechanical term. So again, the labels are not reliable. And uh, it is not, not clear how to treat uh, data points with different reliability. Uh, how to, to, to select which one should be taken into account and which one should be ignored. And your technique seems, seems to answer this yeah. question. Can I just mention about one sentence about the future direction? Sure. So this is what uh, we are trying to propose, which is the ethical learning things. So you had the accelerated learning from the previous information. What we wanted to do is to extend the capability of the previous learning to the ethical learning. What is the example of ethical learning? If you want to build a model which is fair, what do I mean by having a fair decision model? Supposedly, you have a decision models that tell you to give credit or not credit. You have sometimes an information which is protected characteristic. Race, gender, marital status, right? So in the legal scholarship, there is a requirement that you need to be treating people fairly. Means you shouldn't be using the protected characteristic to decide. So if you consider previous information to be the protected characteristic, that would be the satisfying the fair treatment. But you need to use the protected characteristic at training time because you need to satisfy, for example, equal opportunity. Equal opportunity means that you have a match through positive rate between people, female and male, for example. Right? So in this particular fairness or ethical learnings, privileged information is directly applicable to this particular setup where you try to use the accelerated learning to help your training process, but also try to satisfy the ethical learning. So if sometimes you need some ethicality as well, so maybe you can talk to us. Mm -hmm. OK, hopefully Russia is still not so politically correct, although we are moving in that direction uh, quite fast. <laughs> Very fast. Quite fast. OK, uh, let us thank the speaker for a very interesting talk.